Um, and what I wanted to do then is really provide further context as to the process of making, the thinking around what I'm attempting to um, achieve, and then maybe uh, you know a little a discussion around the idea of what the glitch or what the limitations within a particular process and how we control that process then allow us to determine form um, and uh, an appreciation for that form. So to, to start with then, um, what I do is use GPS as a as a drawing tool, effectively. So I utilize the triangulation of, of global satellites to record information. Um, and from that, then, is obviously the body of work that I've kind of put together as an element of my kind of practicing in research, effectively. Um, what I want to start with then is just some kind of inspirational materials. Uh, inspirational, using a very loose term in terms of what they actually visually represent, is not particularly inspiring, but the process that's involved is the bit that is generally inspiring. Um, I use a, um, um, a fitness app. Uh, you may have heard of a, um, an application called Strava. Lots of others are on the market that effectively will you, you, know, you utilize this as a means of recording your bicycle ride or your running activity or whatever. And what it is is a very reliable means of generating GPS uh, data. It's done quite widely. Lots and lots of hobbyists, lots of um, different people use it for different interpretations. It's quite big in the States, particularly where you have, uh, as you can see here, then a gridded or networked city in which you can then kind of pre-control what it is you want to do. Uh, in most of these cases, perhaps apart from the chick at the bottom, he's a, he's a predestined um, exploration. So the, the practitioner here, used in the loosest term perhaps, um, already knows what they want to achieve before they go. They have it mapped out. This is something that they, they determine as they as they walk through this or run through this or cycle through this in some cases. And I like this. I think this is a really interesting method of exploration, but I'm much more interested in a kind of free form and performative approach to how this works, almost like a, like a live process rather than something that is uh, predetermined or um, uh, effectively, then you're you're looking then to go out and record a thing that you've already mapped, rather than use the process as a as a method of, of, of interpretation. Um, second slide then is perhaps inevitable. Um, a colleague of mine decided that he was quite interested in what I was doing, wanted to become involved somehow, and so of course, as is the way. Um, a cock and balls appeared uh, on my Strava trace as a look at what I've done. Um, fascinating. I love the idea that we are, I say we again in the loosest sense, that the drawing of Janet Taylor is often male based, not female based, but it is something that people seem to be unavoidably attached towards doing. Um, I love the idea that this is a landscape, not similar to chalk cliffs or whatever it might be that we find this uh, this, this necessary uh, reason for for generating this this striking visual image. Um, so we'll move through. If I can move through, hang on. Here we are. So this this next slide provides a context for where the uh, work in exhibition took place. This is the University of Salford, um, and effectively is the Peel Park campus, and we're looking specifically at the David Lewis Sports Ground at the back there, or at the top and middle of that image. Um, it's necessary, of course, to obtain triangulation. You need a certain amount of space. And in some of the works I've been producing in the last few weeks, specifically for, to show you uh, over the last few days, I'm quite interested in then how we measure that information. There's a finite sense of what can be measured through GPS, and then, of course, how, it, how accurately that records that. Uh, that sense. If I was to run in or measure something over a sort of seven mile area and that was in a perfect circle, given I could do that, it would measure that with relative accuracy. But of course, the smaller that you get, then of course that invites um, interpretation by the satellite, effectively a, a glitch in that process, if you will. So this is what I'm particularly interested in. But as it is, obviously it needs to be a relatively large base, otherwise the, the, the possibility to re record anything recognisable would be completely useless. So in this case here, um, we have what is effectively a rugby pitch and two football pitches uh, end on end fit into that David Lewis sports ground. So you get a, a, a sense of the, of the scale and the size of, um, of the space that I use. This is uh, 
the context within which the first pieces of work, the uh, typeface called Trace that you may have seen, I'll show you as we go through the next few slides, this is the context for it. So, of course, as you'll know, um, anybody who's used GPS on a smartphone, uh, which is, of course, what I'm using here to record this uh, information, you're not able to see what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, so the lines that are represented here are, as you can see, a football pitch. And this was the context within which I um, performed or created uh, the letter forms for the alphabet. So each of these uh, individual letter forms, as you'll see below, uh, are effectively created around that idea of um, the football pitch. So what it helps for me, of course, is that when it, in designing letter forms, they are mostly based around a kind of um, a form not dissimilar in proportion to that of a football pitch. You have um, the X height, which would effectively be the height of a lowercase letter form, really measures where the halfway line is. Your ascender, uh, which effectively is you know lowercase letter form, is like a, a H or an F or a T, something that something that, that that, that sits higher than the X height, of course, then gives you that um, that space where the full length of the pitch, and of course, a capital letter again will be the full length of that pitch. So it's quite a useful space to be able to then determine how you might um, determine and work with a series of letter forms. What I started with again, this is just this is blindly created. So you're working on a sort of an imaginative process, really. Um, what I liked, or what I wanted to achieve, was to create these letter forms in kind of one go. So none of these have been um, reproduced more than once. It was important in terms of the creation of the letter form that it was something that was uh, unique, but also there was a, an honesty there to that sense of representation. Um, and I'm sure many of you, well, all of you will have uh, had that thorny decision in terms of uh, which typeface to choose for a particular presentation. Most of us, of course, always stick with the same couple. Um, in my case, though, I, I teach typography, I teach creative typography, so it's something I'm particularly uh, interested in. And that interest lies in the extraordinary set of shapes that we learn. And this is, it doesn't matter whether this is Mandarin or Cyrillic or Greek or um, Latin, that we spend such a predominant amount of our time as uh, young people learning these shapes effectively and then imbibing these shapes with sound and with meaning and with uh, connotation that it's a absolutely fundamental part of what we what we do as human beings and our ability to communicate with each other that actually these shapes these building blocks are so fundamental that they can change in the most minutest of ways and then effectively become or have take on a different tone of voice or a different style or a different have bring a different emphasis to how they tell a story particularly obviously relative to the, the written word and so that's what i'm trying to investigate here you know of the tens of thousands of typefaces that exist they mostly differ minutely but those minute changes make significant differences to how we read the information that's given in that particular style so what i wanted to do in creating these uh, letter forms so we'll move on to the, the full typeface as you'll have seen so bearing in mind these are obviously um, within the context these are all the size of a football pitch um, a useful measure of method of measurement um, that it's it's exactly that glitch process it's exactly my ability to not see what i'm doing as i'm doing it but also then for what i'm doing not to be entirely accurately recorded that then brings the style to this particular typeface um it would have of course been much easier just to run a single line um, and effectively have a, a very skinny thin typeface um, it would of course and the intention initially was to then fill this in so there was a solid black version of this typeface but it re i realized over time that actually that was that lost the um, context, despite the fact that when I did fill this in as a full black letter, it looked absolutely dreadful. Um, the idea was actually you lost the context completely. You know, it's the outline, it's the generation and the creation of the outline um, that is important to me. Of course, I intimately know these spaces, and of course, they only exist here. There's no trace left in the landscape. Uh, nothing actually existed from the process of me doing this, other than the digital interpretation of um, of that particular fitness app, and then of course some some post production work um, to generate the actual um, characters themselves. Well, the, the the digital copies that you see here. 
so this as a as a as a thing as an exercise um was uh, a commitment but i was you know very interested in in the production of that um you'll notice from the from the a little, little bit of type and nerdery that um this is what you'd describe as a slab serif typeface um so a serif of course are those those little forms you have on the bottom of a a typeface as opposed to a sans serif typeface which is straighter to me the slab serif became part of the process because it was defined by the environment within which i did it so if you imagine looking at for example um the letter a and the b and the d the e and the f uh, the, the, the h and the i there these would start at the corner flag of um the uh, four pitch and i would run up uh, parallel to the edge of the penalty area and then i would cut across to the penalty area that effectively gave me enough of an interpretation to then determine the overall size and scale of that letter form within the given space. Um, so that's a little bit of geekery for you. Apologies. Um, further works on this, of course, one of the one of the aspects of working with typography or generating or making typefaces, of course, is that it's a very secondary process. Um, I've written a little bit about the idea of typography being subservient to language, um, and it's that subservience that makes it kind of invisible. Partly, what you're taught as a as a um, a nascent typographer is that if the typography is recognized if it's seen if it stands out then it's not doing its job well enough typography should be an invisible vessel upon which words are um, then bestowed and i'm sort of i sort of struggle with that really a little bit in terms of uh, um you know i want typography to express it i want it to be partly something that is that we have control over and that, and that actually is is more than just a a method or a process um, so I started then, of course, again in post-production. Now these are not created uh, as a live performance. Uh, that comes later. That these are then pieced together, piece by piece, as you would have done with a kind of uh, in uh, simpler times um, when you would have um, pieced together a letterpress um, a body of text, for example, by dropping each letter next to each other into a row, and then of course producing a larger body of work from there. So in this case, I started to work with a with a colleague, um, Judy Kendall, who is a creative writer, concrete poet, um, author, and a general lovely individual. Um, and we started to think about this idea of what, how we challenge, or how we use typography and language in a more equitable uh, way, rather than the the, the, the pre-described subservience. And so we looked. I looked at the idea of working with Judy's poems and looking to set this text around her poems. And then we started to discuss ideas of how then she would particularly write poems that were reflective of the process of my making the typeface. And so we looked to share ownership, or we almost looked to co-author an idea of how we could uh, generate text and say things that were expressive not only or representative of the typeface as much as they were um, expressive of a particular thing and so a series of bodies of work were created um, that were specifically designed to to do just that and so of course again in post-production i'm looking then at how uh, i consider the reading of a word and how that then becomes something that is um that is that changes the context of how you look at it and how a viewer then uh, considers what they take from that work uh, rather than the idea of it simply being a body of text that you have to engage with and, and, and work in other words. And it quickly became important or it quickly became relevant actually this became really static and this was something that wasn't really looking to do what I wanted it to do and so we then moved into the idea of uh, a much more performative work whereas rather than cutting and pasting individual letter forms to create a word it became more interesting to think about how you would then create that word as an ensemble as a potentially as a, as a performative piece so these are the first investigations we must start to look at in terms of how i could then imagine a space um, and then conceive of how the word the letter forms might work within that space and again important as a kind of one-shot deal that this happened only once i mean obviously this this takes um 15 20 minutes to produce this kind of work and um running around the field it's not the sort of thing you necessarily want to do two or three times to get right and the idea of course there's no such thing as right the process is what determines the way the word works um and again that became an interesting part of that process in terms of how how then does process inform or the function necessarily inform um, uh, the, the usability of the of the thing? And so you can see here, of course, um, where 
I simply haven't worked the spacing out very well across what is effectively the length of two football fields and a rugby field. Um, the top of the letter B in invisible, of course, is, a, is, a, is a, what you would ordinarily determine as a failure. But I think what's really interesting is it's not something I would have ever sat down and designed had I not then been through this process. And so we talked a little bit yesterday um, about ideas of, of how how using technology, how digital technology and the spaces within that technology allow, becomes a process. So you, you are vaguely in control of what you're doing, although you can't control the output of that. You know something will happen and you predetermine that, that something will be interesting enough for you to go through with it. So you're in control of the process in that sense, but you then allow yourself the freedom or the space within which that process happens to enable uh, the outcome from which you work and so that's exactly the case uh, here that i i knew the process of doing this was something that would work but of course i had no way really of knowing what that might look like it was down to a a technical sense of control but also then left to imagination and some maths and some guesswork and some failure as to actually then what happens. And again, what I like about that is to do this again tomorrow, of course, it would produce something again that would be completely and totally different. So there's a uniqueness to this, which becomes um, something that's a, that, that becomes important in that work. So further to that then, and then reworking with, uh, with Judy to think about how we might then produce a poem that was performed. Um, the idea that this would be recorded um, other than by satellite means um, became part of that practice and that process. It became almost impossible to record this from the point of view of the ground. This needed to be something that was filmed from above. Um, and so again, the idea of then using drone technology to start to think of and film what this looks like and what this means is again, something that we, we, we looked at uh, working with, but it doesn't provide, it provides a literal context. It doesn't actually provide any of the kind of mystique that you have around a given performance. Um, and it's something that I think ultimately um, was an interesting part of the project, but didn't actually bring anything to that that I thought was, um, or that we thought was particularly unique. So of course we start to work with with um, with more structured poetry. I'm obviously entirely delighted that uh, we didn't decide to write, you know, a five stanza poem. That would have been incredibly difficult. But of course that that collaborative process is about understanding the process and the technique of, that, that's being used, and so working accordingly with that interpretation. So these poems, um, or this particular poem, was was something that Judy had written on that on, within the context and within that within that basis. So that gives a sense of of originally where this idea came from. As you can see these are these are four or five years old now. So it's something that has we've written about, we've been to conferences, we've written papers, we've talked about this in, in a variety of different places. And over time we've started to change that emphasis and look at different ways of using this technology as a method of kind of drawing. So less uh, in this case um, what I've always been interested in, particularly with this GPS drawing tool idea, is looking at multiple use, and so how, multiple user use, effectively, and how that how that differs and how that changes. What happens when we have three or four people doing the same thing? How does that get recorded, and what does that look like? How do how does the information be, become interpreted when we have people interacting with each other? And so I looked to our um, uh, BA dance students, as is a level five students, as part of this collaborative practice, and asked them um, in a module where they were specifically asked to collaborate with somebody from a different uh, different department within our school, and so they were quite interested and quite delighted. Less delighted, it was January, so it was cold, um, but they were keen to do this nonetheless. Um, this is January 2019. So what we looked at, um, and then there's a couple of choreographers here, or probably more than a couple of choreographers here, you may be much more of fame with these dance, dance techniques than I am. Um, as a tr set of trial runs, what we looked at were a series of dance techniques. Um, so bulldog and flocking, uh, I particularly love the idea and the, um, uh, the, the process of flocking is a, such a great name and to describe such a lovely thing. Uh, and then, of course, the Laban notation, which I'm quite sure you're much more familiar with. I really enjoyed this process. This was to enable the students to understand the technology. Of course, what they're doing effectively is running around the field with their smartphone, not knowing really what it is that they're, they're going to create. 
I was then able to um, kind of harvest all their different um, um, traces, and then of course build these uh, these ensemble drawings uh, from that basis. So that that what what this what we were working towards was the idea of the students then creating an ensemble, creating a performance piece. Um, or a dance routine effectively in the field using that enormous sense of space and scale to then produce something that was recorded as a, as a drawing and that would then be the performative element. Um, unfortunately as we moved through January and February and it got colder we then moved into March and of course um, then we hit lockdown so that really curtailed um, the project for the next best part of the next 18 months. Um, this I really the, the Laban notation um, is an exercise where um, uh, dancers in a troupe work through a different set of particular methods and processes and I thought this this really was beginning to produce something I thought was was absolutely fascinating um, and absolutely closer to the idea I wanted to imagine rather than an intersection of completely crazy lines that actually you've got syncopation here so you're still looking at some of the most basic drawing tenets of how line how lines intersect with each other to create uh, something of greater meaning that the students were beginning to look at this and of course unfortunately as we, as we were locked down they were they were well into the idea of developing their, their routine but that uh, unfortunately didn't get recorded hopefully that's something we can pick up uh, in the next uh, six to twelve months and consider how that starts to work uh, so good potential interesting stuff here so what I then wanted to do particularly um, with with this conference in mind was look at ideas of how we can measure glitch to for want of a better word and look at the, some of the physical processes of what's involved in 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 that glitch so in this case obviously what I'm looking at um, with some of the most rudimentary tools you could imagine and some particularly interesting stairs from the locals that walk through the park uh, I, have a, I have a garden cane or a stick uh, and effectively I tie string to that stick plant it in the ground the strings at different lengths and so I've got a meter two meters five meters ten meters fifteen meters and so on and so forth and, and very rudimentarily, rudimentarily uh, look to then create circles so a very basic form but something that we can easily measure uh, and so really fascinated with the idea of how then a two meter circle then compares to a five meter or a 20 meter circle and how accurate and how um, how disproportionate some of that information might be so the drawings presented in the exhibition uh, as you can see on the left hand side here uh, come with context and that context of course is the space on that park that I utilized um, with those uh, drawings and this again represents two football fields uh, uh, end on end what I'm looking to create of course is a, is a variety of compositions within those spaces and then what I've done subsequently uh, the lines in between are of course me moving to the stick to pick it out of the ground to go and take it somewhere else and move it across that field so these become the mechanics of the drawing this is the engineering behind it and I'm kind of at the moment I'm interested in actually are the mechanics as interesting as actually the representations these exist on their own these are the intended on the right hand side these are the intended um, drawings in terms of that representative idea of um, glitch through space uh, within the context of those performances but actually as a drawing there's something more interesting about being able to see the workings or the engineering of that particular process uh, similar ideas here um, as we move through so with and without that that kind of context there's something of course about the compositional elements of the context providing the edge of the field of course you, you then have your object represented within that space so that, that that compositional concern becomes enormously important and of course in any kind of performance composing within a given space is absolutely key so I'm lending myself more towards the idea that actually providing the context and the mechanics of the drawings actually there's a an honesty we talked about before with the idea that um, a sense of control that we have that we do have in post-production certainly over how we look at these 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 glitches uh, Manoli talked interestingly yesterday I think about the idea of trying to control that process or trying to recreate a glitch and just actually how complicated and how difficult that is that actually what we do is we have we do do a lot of that in post-production and we do think about the idea of something happened I'm not sure what it was but I like it and so how can I use it um, and so really that's very much how this how these how these pieces of work and how the bodies of work um, uh, came together um, and then as a last slide um, this then is the the first piece of work I did on this series which is uh, a one two three four and five meter 
set of string running in a concentric circle. So ideally, this should look like a um, uh, a target, you know, like a circular target or a dartboard. But of course, it doesn't because it's particularly small. So this is a really interesting, potentially interesting example of the limitations of the technology. But then the technology's attempt to try and recreate what it was that I was doing. Um, and so this kind of spider's web effectively is um, uh, you know, a, a, an interpretation of, of, of that size and that scale and, and you know, embodies the idea of, um, of that glitch. Um, should you be interested at all, there are some papers you can find uh, there to go and read further about thoughts rather than just little to me uh, garbling on. Um, but yeah, that's it. I'm done. Thank you.